Uh, Your Royal Highness, uh, members of the Council, ladies and gentlemen, Foreign Secretary. Um, it's a great pleasure to welcome the Foreign Secretary here this morning to speak on counterterrorism. Um, he'll speak for about 30 minutes. We've got about 15 minutes then for Q&A, which will have to be brisk, uh, and he has to be out of the door by just after quarter to uh, 12. It's a delight to welcome the Foreign Secretary here again. He's been, as you know, MP for Richmond since 1989. He was leader of the Conservative Party from 1997 to 2001. He's a celebrated author with uh, recognised biographies of Pitt the Younger and William Wilberforce. And, of course, since 2010, he has been our Foreign, foreign Secretary. It's a great pleasure to welcome you here. Foreign Secretary, sir. Uh, Your Royal Highness, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much and thank you to Rusi for hosting this speech and giving me the opportunity to speak about some very important matters to the government and the country. Uh, on January the 16th, a terrorist group linked to al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb attacked a gas production facility in the Algerian desert. 39 hostages from nine countries died, including six British nationals. It was the largest and most complex attack affecting UK citizens since the 7-7 bombings. It naturally raises questions about the threat posed by al-Qaeda and its affiliates and how we work with others to reduce that threat. The United Kingdom has a long experience of confronting terrorism, and we have some of the finest intelligence agencies and police forces in the world. They stop terrorists from entering our borders, they detect and stop terrorist attack plans, and prevent potential recruits from being radicalized. Thanks to their efforts, there have been no successful attacks on our mainland since 2005. But unless our foreign policy addresses the circumstances in which terrorism thrives overseas, we will always fight a rearguard action against it. We will never give up for a moment, of course, our right to defend ourselves, including through military force if needed. But there is rarely, if ever, a purely military solution to terrorism. We're in a long generational effort to deny terrorist groups the space to operate, to help vulnerable countries develop their law enforcement capabilities, to address the injustice and conflict which terrorists exploit, and to combat their ideology. And we must never forget that those who suffer the most are the citizens of countries blighted by terrorism and extremism, the women and children killed by al-Shabaab suicide bombings in Somalia the girls who cannot go to school in Pakistan because of Pakistani Taliban intimidation, or the communities devastated by al-Qaeda attacks in Iraq. Muslim communities are bearing the brunt of terrorism worldwide at the hands of people who espouse a distorted and violent extremist interpretation of a great and peaceful religion. There can never be any justification for terrorism, the indiscriminate targeting of civilians is contemptible in any shape or form, and our resolve to defeat it must never weaken or falter even for a day. But in standing up for freedom, human rights, and the rule of law ourselves, we must never use methods that undermine those things. As a democracy, we must hold ourselves to the highest standards. This includes being absolutely clear that torture and mistreatment are repugnant unacceptable and counterproductive. Our bottom line is always that we are determined to uphold the law. Any allegation of UK complicity in the sorts of practices I've just mentioned must be investigated fully. So to tackle terrorism, we need to combine creative work from our intelligence agencies and police with intelligent diplomacy. We have to help build stability and the rule of law in other countries, living up to our values at all times. And we need to make common cause with peoples and governments that reject this violence. This combination of intelligence, diplomacy, development, and partnership with other nations is the only way to defeat terrorism over the long term. We must be resolved, decisive, and principled. Twelve years after 9-11, the greatest source of the terrorist threat to the United Kingdom remains al-Qaeda and its ideology. But the nature of the threat has changed in three principal ways. First, it is geographically more diverse. We face a determined al-Qaeda core in Pakistan and Afghanistan's border regions and multiple groups inspired by al-Qaeda in the world's most fragile regions. 
Al-Qaeda in Pakistan is diminished and under severe pressure. Nonetheless, it is still capable of devising sophisticated attacks. As in other parts of the world, it exploits the presence of those Westerners drawn to the region for extremist purposes, and it abuses diaspora links, including to the UK, which are in other ways such an asset to our country. At the same time, Al-Qaeda affiliates in Yemen, Somalia, and other parts of Africa are capable of mounting dangerous attacks. Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula has attempted multiple attacks on aircraft that would have caused mass casualties if they had been successful, such as the attempted printer cartridge bomb. Second, the threat is more fragmented. Al-Qaeda does not control a franchise of groups all operating to the same agenda, however much they would like us to think this. We should not make the mistake of overstating their support or coherence. Al-Shabaab in Somalia, for example, ranges from those who object to the presence of African troops and aspire to establish an Islamist state, to others seeking a greater Somalia in the region, to foreign fighters who regard Somalia as a platform for global terror. However, this fragmentation of the threat means that each group has to be tackled separately and across a far wider area, making a more making for a more complex effort and difficult choices about the prioritization of resources. Third, terrorism today is based even more closely on the exploitation of local and regional issues. Terrorists are constantly searching out new areas where they have the greatest freedom to plan external attacks. They take advantage of unresolved conflicts to infiltrate local communities who otherwise would be likely to reject them. In this way, like a virus, the threat spreads where local defenses are weakest. For example, since its emergence as an Al-Qaeda affiliate in the middle of the last decade, Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb has exploited a sense of exclusion among the Tuareg people across the region. From northern Mali, they plan and conduct terrorist operations, kidnapping foreigners for ransoms to fund their activities. Before the intervention of France, we face the prospect of the Malian state being destroyed by terrorists. The Arab Spring revolutions were a grievous blow, of course, to extremist ideology. The idea that change can be accomplished by the people of a country demanding political and economic freedom contains the seeds of Al-Qaeda's irrelevance, creating the building blocks of stable democracy, the rule of law, and the independence of the judiciary, Constitutions that respect the rights of women and minorities, security forces that can maintain order without repression, and economic development all takes a long time. The assassination of an opposition leader in Tunisia and the attacks on the U.S. consulate in Benghazi demonstrate the security challenges in Arab Spring countries. And that's why we're providing the new Libyan government with advice and technical assistance on police and defense reform, public security, and building justice systems that protect human rights. We should not lose faith in the people of the region. Any suggestion that the repression of the past would somehow be better for the region is wrong. The worst outcome of all would be a lapse back into authoritarianism or conflict. There's no substitute for painstaking work to build a new political order. So we're also devoting £110 million through our Arab Partnership Initiative to civil society and economic reform in the region. But in the short term, extremists and terrorists will take every opportunity to try to hijack these revolutions. Syria is the most acute case of all. The vast majority of people opposing the Assad regime are Syrians, fighting for the future of their country. But Syria is now the number one destination for jihadists anywhere in the world today. This includes a number of individuals connected with the United Kingdom and other European countries. They may not pose a threat to us when they first go to Syria, but if they survive, some may return ideologically hardened and with experience of weapons and explosives. The longer the conflict continues, the greater this danger will become, a point that should not be lost on policymakers in Russia and elsewhere. More innocent lives will be lost, extremists will be emboldened, sectarianism will increase, and the risk of the use of chemical or biological weapons will grow. A negotiated agreement leading to a new government formed of the opposition and elements of the regime on the basis of mutual consent is the best way to chart a way out of Syria's divisions. We want Russia and China to join us in achieving this transition, backed by the United Nations Security Council. 
But there's a serious risk that the violence will worsen, and we must keep open options to help save lives in Syria and to assist opposition groups that are opposed to extremism. So we're working with other European countries now to amend EU sanctions so that the possibility of additional assistance is not closed off. We also believe the EU must take robust action in response to, a, the, to the terrorist attack on a bus carrying Israeli tourists in Bulgaria last year. The Bulgarian investigation has indicated that Hezbollah's military wing was responsible. The European Union must demonstrate that no organization can carry out terrorism on European soil without consequences. And as we work to eliminate safe havens for terrorists further afield, we must be clear that no state should allow terrorist groups to operate from its territory and that terrorism as a tool of foreign policy is always unacceptable. If we know that the threat we face from terrorism is likely to come from a wider range of fragile countries, that plots against the United Kingdom are frequently prepared overseas, and that we cannot disrupt such plots without working with nations where the risk originates, then a long-term coordinated international approach is the only way we can defeat terrorism. The government's counterterrorism strategy, CONTEST, combines a full range of international and domestic responses, ranging from the overt to the covert, from security to development, through to working with our communities at home. We have maintained and, where necessary, increased police, intelligence, and other counter-terrorist capabilities. We are ensuring that we have the powers in place to detect, investigate, disrupt, and prosecute terrorist activity through legislative changes. And we've made significant improvements at our borders to reduce threats to their security and to civilian aircraft. We're also making continuous improvements to improve the complex coordinated response needed from our police, agencies, and emergency services if acts of terror do take place, learning lessons from attacks such as those in Mumbai in 2008, in Norway in 2011, and in Toulouse in 2012. In the 12 months leading up to July last year, more than 220 people were arrested in the United Kingdom for terrorism-related offenses. So the threat from homegrown terrorism remains challenging. So we also work to prevent people from becoming terrorists or supporting terrorism. This includes resisting the efforts of those who actively seek to stoke tensions with Muslims in Britain. The government and all communities need to continue to work together so that we can reject messages of division, hate, and extremism wherever they originate. But a large part of our effort to counter terrorism is now overseas, where terrorists train and plan for attacks, attacks against the UK or our interests abroad. We cannot do this without working with other countries. First of all, we must address the conditions in which terrorism thrives. Whether it's restarting the Middle East peace process or intensifying our conflict prevention work to help fragile countries become more stable and secure. Helping Somalia is a major priority for our government. Two years ago, Al-Shabaab controlled large parts of the country, piracy was booming, and the threat from terrorism was growing. Today, a coordinated effort by the international community has seen African and Somali troops drive Al-Shabaab out of its strongholds, the creation of a new and legitimate government, and the reduction of piracy to its lowest levels since 2008. In May, there will be a second conference here in London to plan support to rebuild Somalia's armed forces, police, coast guard, justice system, and public finances. We must never assume that what works in one country will work exactly in another. But the key features of what is working in Somalia are helping a new legitimate government, African troops bringing peace and security, with the international community giving constant diplomatic, financial, and humanitarian support. This should be the model that we follow elsewhere in Africa, wherever we can, including in Mali, where a full and inclusive democratic process, including talks with non-violent groups in the north, and support for Malians to rebuild their livelihoods is urgently needed. As a country, we give generous humanitarian assistance to countries affected by conflict, including 13 million pounds in Mali, now 55 million pounds in Yemen, and 80 million pounds in Somalia in the current financial year. We must also strengthen the ability of states to counter terrorism while protecting human rights, as called for by the UN. This is extremely difficult and challenging work. 
since the threat from terrorism is greatest in the countries where the rule of law and human rights are weakest. And that is why today I wish to set out the clear direction the government will follow over the coming years. When we detect a terrorist plot originating in a third country, we want to be in a position to share information to stop that planning and do it in a way that leads to the arrest, investigation, and prosecution of the individuals concerned in accordance with our own legal obligations and with their human rights respected at every stage. This gives rise to extremely difficult ethical and political decisions, such as whether to pass on information which might save lives and disrupt an imminent attack, but which could also create a risk of someone being mistreated if detained. Our secret intelligence service has the lead responsibility for sharing intelligence with foreign partners on terrorist threats. Requests to share intelligence in these difficult and finely balanced circumstances come to me. Where there are serious risks, it is right that it's the Foreign Secretary that takes the ultimate responsibility for these decisions, just as it is right that our Parliament and ultimately the courts hold governments to account. In many cases, we're able to obtain credible assurances from our foreign partners on issues such as detainee treatment and legal processes that give us the safeguards we need and the confidence that we can share information in this way. Where this is not the case, we face a stark choice. We could disengage or we can choose to cooperate with them in a carefully controlled way while developing a more comprehensive approach to human rights adherence. This approach brings risk, but I am clear that the risks of the first option of stepping back are greater still, placing our citizens at greater risk of terrorist attack. The need to cooperate with other countries is growing for all the reasons I have described. So I am convinced that we need to have a coherent approach that is sustainable for the long term, that upholds our laws and has safeguards, and that works to strengthen the ability of other countries to observe human rights and meet their own obligations. How we go about this will have to vary from country to country depending on the scale and nature of the challenge. But we will seek justice and human rights partnerships with countries where there is both a threat to the United Kingdom's security and weaknesses in the law enforcement, human rights and criminal justice architecture of those countries. These are not one-off initiatives or standalone agreements, but rather, as the name suggests, a systematic process of working with the authorities in question to identify shortcomings in capability and to address these through the provision of British assistance and expertise over many months or years. The sorts of measures we will take include building up the counter-terrorism capacity of overseas security services to improve compliance with the law and human rights and to make them more effective, working with local investigators to improve the ability to build cases based on evidence rather than on confessions, supporting prosecutors and judges to ensure that they're capable of processing terrorism cases through the court systems effectively, fairly, and in line with the rule of law, and working to improve and, where appropriate, monitor conditions in detention facilities so that convicted terrorists can be held securely and their treatment meets with international standards. We're already doing many of these things. In Somalia, for example, we're already working with the UN Office on Drugs and Crime to construct prisons to hold convicted pirates in facilities that meet international standards. What I'm making clear today is that given the changing nature of the threat I have described and given our determination to uphold human rights and the law, we will be doing more of this and developing more of these partnerships. But crucially, we're creating a strong and systematic framework for this work with strong safeguards, with five safeguards. First, we will only engage in such efforts where there is serious and potentially long-running threat to the UK or our interests abroad such as that flowing from terrorist networks in South Asia, Yemen, and parts of North and West Africa. Second, all our counter-terrorism capacity building work will be carefully considered in line with our overseas security and justice assistance guidance in order to assess and to mitigate human rights risks and specifically designed to improve human rights standards and strengthen the rule of law in that country. Third, it will not be carried out in isolation, but will be part of UK and international diplomatic and development efforts in that country. 
Fourth, the intelligence dimension will be subject to the same robust scrutiny and oversight that exists in other areas of intelligence activity and always be in accordance with the law. Fifth, every aspect of this work requires ministerial oversight and approval. If I or another responsible minister see any credible evidence that our support is being misused, we will take immediate action. Any work that would involve breaking our legal obligations simply would not go ahead. So this is a framework of accountability and human rights to ensure that our counter-terrorism work supports justice and the rule of law, as well as our security, with the goal of creating the long-term conditions for better observance of human rights in countries that have a poor record and where the threat from terrorism is strong. We believe that the British people can have confidence in this framework, that it puts UK capacity building overseas onto a surer footing, and that it will give greater confidence that UK and international law and our democratic values are upheld. Even with these safeguards in place, there may be some people who say that this approach is wrong. But we cannot keep our country safe if we are not cooperating at all with countries that don't fully live up to our standards. Only a minority of countries in the world do that. We have to work with other countries. Justice and human rights partnerships will be a powerful framework for doing so. Without such partnerships, our ability to tackle threats before they reach the United Kingdom would be severely limited. And there are good arguments that by introducing important legal and human rights concepts and professional ways of tackling terrorism, and by insisting on the highest standards ourselves, we can encourage better human rights observance in those countries. Achieving security, justice, and advances in human rights together will not always be straightforward. And despite our best efforts, we may not always succeed. But it will always be our aim. This is consistent with one of our first acts as a government on this issue, which was to issue consolidated guidance to intelligence officers and service personnel on the detention and interviewing of detainees overseas to ensure their actions uphold our domestic law and our international obligations. Additionally, the Prime Minister also asked the Intelligence Services Commissioner to oversee compliance with the guidance. We're also taking steps to strengthen parliamentary scrutiny and oversight of the agencies through the Justice and Security Bill currently being considered by Parliament. This also aims to ensure, where strictly necessary, that judges in civil cases relating to matters of national security will be able to consider all relevant material, including sensitive material, to ensure that justice is done while upholding national security. The, the objective is not to hide away the actions of the most secret parts of the state, but precisely the opposite, to strengthen their accountability and public confidence in them as they go about their difficult, dangerous, and necessarily secret work. Few, if any, countries have a stronger system of clear guidance, ministerial decision-making, and strength of legal considerations in the area of counterterrorism than we do. We are a world leader in upholding the highest possible standards. But we're also a country that needs to be able to keep people safe, and that is threatened by many who would do great harm to our citizens. Therefore, we also intend to be foremost in the world in how we develop partnerships that are effective in protecting our security while upholding human rights. Far from being contradictory, these two concepts go together. In tackling terrorism overseas, we must approach the world as it is rather than as we would like it to be. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to shape it and improve it, and when necessary, find means of working with others in ways that are consistent with our values, the very values which terrorism is intent on destroying. So this is our government's approach to tackling terrorism overseas. Governments, agencies, police, and prosecutors working together in a coherent, long-term manner to address immediate threats from terrorism and the causes of terrorism, combating terrorism while upholding our values within a framework of strong democratic accountability, seeking greater respect for human rights in other countries, and using foreign and development policy to build stability in fragile countries. This is how we enable the greater global cooperation that is essential to eliminating the risk from international terrorism over time and support a safe, secure, and prosperous future for our country. Thank you very much indeed.
Foreign Secretary, thank you very much indeed. I think you've given us a very tough and realistic statement uh, in an attempt to get ahead of the agenda and to create a greater integration, as you said, between intelligence, diplomacy, development and partnerships. And I think that's a very clear message which we can absorb. So we have, that clock is about two minutes fast, incidentally, so we have about uh, 17 or 18 minutes for questions. So uh, let's indicate uh, what you'd like. So uh, John Gearson, at the back there, and I'll come around here. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, John Gearson from King's College. Um, thank you very much for your uh, very interesting talk. Um, can I ask, if I may paraphrase what you've said, we are going to be moving from a fairly overt footprint in our kinetic end of, of military force deployed overseas to a much lighter footprint, it seems to me, um, going back into the shadows rather more. Are you confident that, notwithstanding what you said about the Justice Bill moving through Parliament, whether structures such as the relatively modest changes to the Intelligence and Security Committee's oversight abilities are going to be sufficient to cover what is going to be a fairly major part of our national security in the future? Yes. Um, just to, um, well, just to tackle the first part, the, what's implicit in the first part of your question, I don't see this as going back into the shadows. Um, if you look at um, what we're doing in Somalia now, we're using the full range of foreign policy as well as intelligence work. Um, and the extent of our development funding, the holding of international conferences here in London, the promotion with other countries of a legitimate government, the reaching of anti-piracy agreements with uh, countries around that region that have uh, also had a big impact on the prevalence of piracy. None of this is in the shadows. Um, and of course, there is one component of this, is good intelligence work and intelligence cooperation with other countries. Now, that is necessarily secret work. It wouldn't be effective uh, if it wasn't secret. But on the, the second part of your question, uh, yes, we are improving the, um, uh, we're strengthening the, the Intelligence and Security Committee. Um, I think I, I can assure you that the, even now the accountability is very, very strong. Um, in fact, I think if people could sometimes see on the inside the extent uh, of the attention we give to all legal considerations, of the huge range of um, decisions that are referred to ministers, um, of the detail that ministers go into with the Intelligence and Security Committee, um, they'd be quite surprised, uh, actually, uh, at the trouble that is taken and the, therefore the democratic accountability that is in there. They're not things that we can talk about on the floor of the House of Commons, um, but the accountability is there to an effective committee via ministers who spend much more of their time on these things than you would ever think from the outside, uh, speaking from my personal experience over the last three years. So yes, uh, the answer to your question is yes, I am confident uh, that what we're proposing will be sufficient. Thank you. Rufal Smart from the director of the SIS on the front row here. Tom <laughs> Coglum. <clears throat> Behind you, Tandy. Tom, <clears throat> uh, Tom Coglum from the uh, Times. Um, Foreign Secretary, from your vantage point on the inside, uh, would you say that the uh, threat of a successful attack on the UK mainland has, uh, is, is greater or lesser now than it was in 2005? Well, we do have a... Um, we published the... And uh, this is more the Preserve of the Home Secretary, uh, of course, but the government publishes the state of alert uh, that we should be on. Uh, and, of course, that level of alert was reduced uh, over the last couple of years um, because we have been successful in tackling many of the threats. But we must never be complacent about that. The threat hasn't gone away. Um, and it will be very important to get ahead of the next threat. What I'm really talking about today is making sure that we are dealing with future threats as well as current threats. Um, because just because we have achieved a lot of success, and, and it's hard to overstate that the successes that our, that our intelligence agencies, our other uh, security services and police forces have had in the last few years. Just because we've had those uh, successes uh, doesn't mean that the threat couldn't grow again in the future. Um, so we publish that level of threat uh, when it's changed, when it's been changed from severe to substantial. We have published that. That's the government's view of the threat. 
Um, but it can, it will, it, it's a threat that's constantly changing and developing in the way that I've described, becoming more fragmented, um, a threat that could arise from more countries, um, that can um, attract Europeans, including British people, uh, to go to areas uh, now affected by conflict and become a threat to the United Kingdom. Uh, so we need to get ahead of future threats in our ability to uh, tackle these things, and that's really what the, um, the proposals I've just been outlining are about. Thank you. Uh, Jonathan Isle. Uh, Jonathan Isle from here, from the Institute. I apologize for a slightly technical question, um, and I do appreciate what you said, that it is uh, a work in progress. But are you envisaging, in our engagement with governments, some of which may be less savory than others, are you envisaging uh, a, a sort of a, a treaty being concluded, a particular document that will be a frame document for cooperation, or are you envisaging small steps incrementally with these governments? The reason I'm asking, of course, is are we likely to have a document which a future court will demand to see? Hmm. Uh, no, is the answer to that. Um, it's not a technical question, it's a very important uh, question. Um, this is these um, that justice and human rights partnerships I've talked about will vary a lot from one country to another. Um, yes, they are. Inv they involve many different steps. You, I'm not necessarily going to use the phrase small steps because some of them are quite big steps for the countries involved um, to uh, improve their capacity to investigate, detain, and prosecute people in the way that I have described. That is that meets our standards. Um, but it certainly is um, an accumulation of many different things, and it involves cooperation on the part of many different agencies, the provision of expertise in many different forms. Um, it isn't um, a single off-the-shelf answer that can just be applied to everybody. Um, because, of course, the needs of each country, the weaknesses in each country will be different. Um, and some of it, of course, is secret in nature. Intelligence cooperation has to be, and, and sharing has to be secret in nature, otherwise that intelligence would soon dry up. Um, and some of it um, will be, uh, would, if we publicize the details of it, rather than this concept, uh, would bring danger to people involved. Um, and some of it, if we try to set it out in a treaty, uh, if we tried to set out all the arrangements of the treaty, it would actually make it harder for some of the countries in question to agree to it. Uh, so these are um, uh, a mixture of measures, um, and we won't be publishing a list of all the countries and exactly uh, what we have agreed with them, particularly in the intelligence field. There is a lot I, I've pointed in my speech to some things that we do quite obviously, such as the prisons that we are helping to build in Somalia. Um, there is a lot of work that we do that is um, it's not secret in any way to build capacity in other countries in their justice systems. In fact, again, with reference to Somalia, one of the things, one of our objectives in the conference that we'll hold in May is to uh, help them to improve the functioning of their entire judicial uh, system. Um, but it is a mixture of these things and other things, uh, not written down in a single treaty, and it will constantly have to be adjusted and constantly subject to ministerial accountability. We may have to say, we do have to say from time to time, I mean, we already face these things, stop cooperating in that area um, because we're not satisfied yet or something has changed, something has got worse in the country in question. That will arise as well. So it's not a static single formula and it's not one that can be um, published in a treaty. Thank you. I'm not sure what's happened to the microphone on this side, but if Kim senegupta has got it, it's your turn next. Kim. Um, Kim Senegupta from The Independent. Uh, Foreign Secretary, you mentioned the intrinsic need to make sure that human rights are maintained, abuses are not carried out in areas where the UK are involved in counterterrorism or counterinsurgency operations. You also uh, mentioned Mali uh, several times as well. In the last two weeks, we have seen, some of us physically seen, members of the Malian military carry out summary executions of Tuaregs. Uh, we have seen the Arab and Tuareg residents of Timbuktu being driven out and other such abuses. And I just wonder how you create your very laudable aims of upholding 
human rights with what sometimes goes on on the ground, especially not so much in intelligence sharing, but in, in fluid, violent conflict situations? Well, these things, it's a good question. These things do, of course, underline the difficulties involved. We are dealing with countries that are enduring conflict in some cases, um, or that have ungoverned space um, within their uh, territory. And that, of course, makes these things uh, extremely difficult, but it underlines the importance of what I was saying about the, the need for, legit, for us to promote legitimate government. And legitimate government, of course, uh, in our view, means democratic government accountable to people within a framework of law, uh, with a functioning judiciary um, and rule of law. It means we must promote that as part of the solution uh, in any of these countries, again, as we've been doing in successfully uh, so far in Somalia. Um, and it means um, that we have to promote political processes where necessary. And, of course, that is a very important part of the solution in Mali. Uh, the French have been right to rescue the situation in an emergency militarily. And that's why we have supported them, with, not with combat troops, but with uh, transport, with surveillance. Um, now we are putting a, uh, we're ready to put a major effort into the training of African forces. Um, because uh, it's an important part of this, as I stated earlier, that it's troops from the region in each case that are deployed to do any fighting that is necessary. So the political process is very important. And then using the establishment of legitimate government and the existence of a political process to try to inculcate into the country concerned uh, respect for human rights, um, avoiding the sorts of incidents that have been reported, making sure the security forces of the state are not involved in such things. That all helps us to be able to build this sort of cooperation. Um, but the, the choice we face here is to um, either to turn away completely from such situations, say there is nothing we can do, mm -hmm. or to adopt this framework and try to bring about the things I've just described. Uh, and it's not possible in, in Mali, for instance. It wouldn't be wise for us to say, well, there are terrible things that happen, um, and uh, therefore we can't be related to it at all. We can't help at all. That would be the wrong response and wrong for our national security. Okay, thank you. Let's take a round of, of three questions. The gentleman in the gallery, um, if you can just put a microphone up there, uh, Lady Kennett and Charlie Edwards. We'll do those three. Quick, quick questions, please. <clears throat> So. Um, good, good morning, sir. Um, Frank Baldwin, Battlefields Trust. I'm more interested normally in um, matters to do with the 800th anniversary of Magna Carta or the Wars of the Roses, but some of the things you've said do actually have a resonance. You talked about the importance of the rule of law and the importance of being perceived by other countries and other peoples as following that rule of law. I have a concern that the... Um, liberties that were won through things like Magna Carta and over the past several hundred years are undermined by the, by the Justice and Security Act, which, in, which enables um, secret trials. Now, in the same way that Richard III was not perceived as plausible by his people or by other states when he undertook activities in secret with the princes in the tower, and how does he reconcile the Security and Justice Bill with the perception that's going to be created of his government? OK, we got the point. Um, Charlie Edwards. Foreign Secretary, I've, I've just returned from Somalia, uh, where I've seen firsthand the lack of capacity in the ministries of interior, uh, the intelligence agencies and wider government. Um, I wondered uh, where this new money uh, you mentioned would co come from. Uh, officials on the ground are very concerned that there is a lack of investment. Uh, there doesn't seem to be a huge amount of coordination uh, from donor countries. And given public uh, spending constraints here, uh, where do we find the new money to do what you want to do overseas to counter terrorism? Okay, and thirdly, Lady Kennett. Elizabeth Kennett, alias Elizabeth Young. Um, last summer there was a, an attack, a cyber attack on Aramco by an organization that called itself the Cutting Sword of Justice. Now, do you suppose this to have been a cyber attack um, organized by Al-Qaeda or by Iran, as some have suggested, or do you think it was a, 
a genuine terrorist organization, engaging for the first time, I think, in cyber terrorism. And second question, oh, I fear, uh, one, one question are you, Sorry, we're are you out going of time. to support, are you going to support um, assassination by drone? Right. Um, right. That was a little <laughs> rider. A variety of questions. <laughs> um, right, just to run through quickly the, um, if I can, those questions. Um, yes, well, we, we're moving on from the Wars of the Roses, um, which in Yorkshire we regard as a, a temporary setback, uh, I have to say, um, for the moment. Um, on to the Justice and Security Bill. It's not yet an act, of course. It is a, um, it's a bill being considered uh, in Parliament now. It's in the House of Commons now. Um, I think it's very important to stress that this is about justice, that there is no... that this term is used, secret courts, but it's very important to understand um, that there is nothing now in practice that is considered in open court that will be considered... In, under closed material procedures that will be uh, considered in secret. What happens now under current arrangements is the material is not considered at all. Uh, it's not possible uh, to have hearings in open court that involve um, intelligence, uh, many matters uh, affecting uh, intelligence, and so such matters, such matters are not considered at all. Um, governments have to settle cases whether or not uh, they are, whether or not there's any culpability. Um, because they cannot fight the case. That is not justice. Uh, or public interest immunities certificates uh, remove all, mm, remove the material uh, from consideration by a court. Closed material procedures are a much better option where a court can consider, albeit in a confidential way, all of the relevant material. And now that's, that's better justice. And it isn't moving anything into secrecy that is now considered in the open. It's very important to, uh, for everyone to understand that about the Justice and Security Bill. On Somalia, where is the new money? There is um, there are always hard choices about prioritizing resources, um, but we do have in the Foreign Office, for instance, this year we have, um, we have 36 million pounds of programs on counterterrorism. Um, of course, the, the intelligence agencies also have uh, relevant budgets, um, and our development uh, expenditure is rising rapidly. In fact, in the coming year, we will become one of the few countries in the world to meet the UN target of 0.7% of gross national income spent on overseas development assistance. Um, and so the, we do have substantial budgets. One of, the, this, one of the reasons we're in a position as a country, as few countries are in the world, to to move the dial on something like Somalia, to actually affect the situation, is because we can bring together our position on the UN Security Council, our diplomatic strength in, in most of the world, um, our connection, our global connections uh, with other countries uh, with a similar role, and one of the largest development budgets and most professional diplomatic services. When all of those things come together, you can actually affect events. Uh, and so uh, the money, Quite a lot of money does exist uh, for that purpose. Um, then on the, um, on the questions suddenly bold at the end, uh, there, um, the, well, on, we've, I can't expand on what we've said before on drones. Uh, that's a matter for the countries concerned. Um, and it's very important at all times that we uphold international law. Uh, I would simply stress that. Um, but on the specific, on the cyber attacks on uh, Aramco, um, again, I can't go into details about what we know about those things, but I can say, it's a different subject really from this, it would be a whole other speech, um, that cyber attacks are on the increase, um, that the great majority of cyber attacks um, are either state-sponsored or the result of the work of criminal networks, criminal networks more than terrorist networks, but you can't exclude uh, some terrorist networks attempting such attacks in some way. Uh, but the, the great majority of such cyber attacks are criminal or state-sponsored in nature. Foreign Secretary, thank you very much indeed. I'm sorry, I, we think we need to draw it to a close there, and I apologize to the people that we couldn't uh, include questions from. Foreign Secretary does have to get away.
Um, the struggle of, uh, against terrorists goes on. The most important thing is that they don't get control of the agenda. And I think what the Foreign Secretary has indicated today is a very clear uh, intention and some very specific measures to prevent that from happening. Um, Your Royal Highness, sir, as our President, it's always a pleasure to see you here at our meetings. And Foreign Secretary, thank you, sir, for a very important and, imp uh, and impressive speech. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> you need to